much entirely certain it is. I mean, there are, I've heard about movements afoot within the Democratic Party to make some changes internally there, especially as the polls seem to weigh more heavily or increasingly heavily uh, on the Trump side. Um, well, in terms of those issues for us, uh, for the Middle East, it's all going to depend on what position Donald Trump takes. And so far, he's been very uh, equivocal about it. He's criticized Israel. He's criticized Hezbollah. He's praised Hezbollah, criticized Hamas. We don't know. But let's take, for example, a, a hypothetical situation where Donald Trump says, if I were president, I would take this war to Iran. That Iran is getting away scot-free. It's sending all of its proxies to shoot our troops in Iraq and Syria. It's stopping international ship shipping through its Houthi pro proxies in Yemen. And it's driving up gas prices. It's driving up consumer prices. We've got to stop this. I'm about, I want to defend America and show that America is great again on the world stage. He could say that. Or he could say is, you know, look how, what a mess the Democrats have gotten us into in the Middle East again. Our troops are getting shot. They shouldn't even be in Iraq and Syria. We shouldn't care about the Houthis in, uh, in, in the Mandeb Straits. What do we care about that? We don't even know where it is. He could, he could do either one. Um, and either one would have a big impact on the Democratic ticket, too. Um, because if he takes a, a muscular position, it will say that will be, that will be a campaign issue. Which, con which, which candidate, which party is going to stand up uh, for America's interests in the world and what those interests are? Um, so it really hangs in the balance. We have to wait to see a major policy statement uh, from the Trump people. As for the Democratic side, the Democratic Party's policy in the Middle East, to my mind, is kind of just in disarray. It's very, people ask me what the policy is, and I actually don't have an answer for them. Because on one hand, um, the president, and I would stress the president, not necessarily his entire administration, is keeping two vital policies uh, open toward us. One is keeping to, get, continuing to cast vetoes in the Security Council against blocking any attempt to oppose a ceasefire, and I think even more importantly, maintaining a flow of vital ammunition to the Israel Defense Forces, both. Um, on the other hand, endless criticism of the way Israel is conducting the war, leaks in the American press that Israel cannot win this war, that it is going, uh, leaks in the American press that Israel is going too slow, it's taking too long to win, but also Israel is going too fast. I get both of them, by the way, going too slow and too fast and causing too many Palestinian casualties, not cooperating with the administration on the day after, two-state solution, Palestinian authority. Uh, refugees is a long, long list uh, of complaints. Um, and most recently, during the uh, press conference of Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, was a very curious change in American policy, whereas uh, earlier in this war, both the President and Secretary of State subscribed to the Israeli formula, the goal of the war is to destroy Hamas. Now the goal of the war, according to Anthony Blinken, is to ensure that the events of October 7th never happen again very different policy. Why? Uh, to ensure that never happened again, one way to ensure that would be the creation of a Palestinian unity government, uh, which involves, uh, headed by the Palestinian Authority, which could involve membership, participation of technocratic elements from Hamas. And I say that without you know, any hesitation, uh, which wouldn't be very acceptable to the state of Israel. But it's a, it's a significant dis departure from the earlier uh, uh, commitment to destroy Hamas. So, um, that policy is not clear. It is firing at the Houthis a bit, but not enough to stop to truly deter them. Firing at uh, pro Shiite, uh, pro a Shiite, pro Iranian militias in Iraq and Syria, a bit, but not enough to deter them. Um, and refusal to say the I word, which is Iran. You can't get anybody in the administration to actually say that Iran is behind all of this, or to say, listen, Iran's going to pay a price for this. Certainly, a lot of confusion. Um, that confusion either could be solved by a statement by Donald Trump or deepened by a statement by Donald Trump. When we're talking about the reverse direction, the effect that the war is going to have on the election and therefore the outcomes that you just mentioned, are we perhaps overstating it? Certainly, there's a lot of talk about Americans caring about the situation in the Middle East, but the actual polls, when they're asked what their primary issues are, if you ask how many Americans think that Israel and uh, the Palestinian conflict is a primary concern to them, is only about 1%. I would imagine, until it comes home to them. You know, I think Iran, via the Houthis, are trying to do to the United States and the West what OPEC did to them in 1973-74 by raising oil prices, creating a crisis. What's going to happen if they close the straits, the Mandeb straits, uh, prices are going to go up. Uh, the prices of your cars are already going to go up. 
Uh, there's going to be shortages. Gas prices are going to go up. No president wants that in election year. It's the last thing you want. And all of a sudden, that's going to put pressure on the administration to put pressure on Israel. It's what oil did in 1973. Uh, we, it could be very effective. Um, the Iranians, um, <laughs> venal they may be, they are not stupid. Uh, and it's an effective tool, particularly in the, a vulnerable election year. That's all, that's all President Biden needs is long lines at the gas stations. That's all he needs. So, um, your question, it's, it's, uh, I forgot what your question was, Ariel. We were going on and on here. <laughs> the, the question being is the, the, it was, are we worrying in outsize of oh, the, this impact yeah. American policy? It will become, American, American, Americans will care more about what's going on here if it's affecting their pocketbooks. On that very same front, though, it seems to be a gamble to assume the United States will pressure Israel into a ceasefire that goes against its existential interests, rather than if Iran initiates a blockage of the entire world economy, simply drawing the United States directly into a confrontation or a war with Iran, especially in an election year, because oftentimes if there is a war, especially a war started by a foreign power, it's only going to increase the support for the administration that is at war. Well, that was the case certainly in 9-11. It made the administration, Bush's uh, approval level before 9-11 was down in the 30s, and then it went up to the 90s. But I don't know if that's true today. Uh, America's changed a lot in the last 20 years. And, uh, and I think uh, not just the, the isolationist impulse, but uh, the people who are involved in this. I mean, the people who would be highly critical of America's involvement in this war, the same people who are critical of the, of the Biden administration's support for Israel in the war. It's the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. It's uh, young liberals. Uh, we've all looked at the polls about uh, Israel's uh, very poor showing in those polls and, and slipping further. Um, and uh, to get involved in a war on the side of Israel, or even perceived side of Israel, would not necessarily play uh, well in key constituencies, and key constituencies in swing states like Michigan, which have um, not just a long, young population, but a very large Arab-American and Muslim-American 